On a brisk February morning in the Yuma, Arizona desert, a swarm of unmanned aerial vehicles equipped with DARPA's Collaborative Operations in Denied Environment System, or CODE, successfully carried out mission objectives, even when communications were offline and GPS was unavailable. One by one, six RQ-23 Tiger Sharks lifted off, fitted with an array of sensors on board. Next to the runway at the U.S. Army's Yuma Proving Ground, the mission team inside a small operations center tracked the aircraft and another 14 virtual planes on an aerial map. The capstone demonstration paired program performer Raytheon's software and autonomy algorithms and Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory's White Force Network to create a realistic, live virtual constructive test environment. During four demonstration runs, the team marked aircraft for virtual disablement to see how well they could complete their objectives in suboptimal conditions. One of the most challenging aspects of this program is how we actually have these vehicles work together in a comms denied environment. Previously, the vehicle is actually waiting for um, an operator to tell it what to do or it's going to go down a pre-planned path. Well, in this scenario, what you have is different threats popping up or changes in the environment which make the system want to change. And so as the system is making these changes, if it doesn't have access to the operator, it could still do so as long as it's following the rules of engagement. The Tiger Sharks employed in the demonstration are surrogate assets for code. Each is about one-tenth the speed and capability of the aircraft plan for integration, but shows traceability to larger platforms. It's easy to uh, take uh, the code software and move it from uh, platform to platform, both from a computer perspective but also from a, a vehicle perspective. It can be an unmanned aircraft, could be a manned aircraft, could be a, a ground vehicle. The concept that was used in code is play-based tactics, and so you can create new tactics relatively easily to go from mission to mission. The fact that this program is government owned really allows us to have different organizations work with us even if they're not doing the exact same thing we are doing. Uh, for instance, there are many times when the Air Force and the Navy are doing parallel efforts, uh, and rightfully so because they have different objectives. What we're trying to do with code is set the foundation that is government owned so that if they want to come in and use all the work that we've done, they could take that and then modify it to suit their needs. The Naval Air Systems Command, NAVAIR, will take ownership of code after DARPA closes out the agency's role in the program this year. It already has built a repository of algorithms tested throughout the development process. What we're doing with the laboratory that we've set up is not just for the Navy or NAVAIR. We're trying to make our capabilities available throughout the entire DOD community. So if the Army wanted to be able to leverage what DARPA code has done, we provide them not only with the software, but an open development environment with all the proper security protocols already taken care of. In addition to that, we have a cadre of people who have hands-on real knowledge with the system, who are actually working hand-in-hand -hand with the contractor, helping them add capability and fix capability, so that if the Army or the Air Force or any other DOD entity wanted to add a capability, we can help them set up their lab and get it started. So we, want, we see ourselves as being not only a naval resource, but as a DOD resource. That ease of transition puts code technologies on a clear path to assist deployed service members. Thank you.